Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Jan Lufau here with Microchip. Uh, I will give you some ideas here of what we're doing with Microchip and machine learning and edgeables. Uh, with me today, we have Thomas Garcia, application engineer, which give you a demo in the second part of the, uh, of the presentation here. Uh, just a few words to start is, you know, who, we are, who is Microchip? Maybe not everybody know that. Uh, basically, we are a total system solution provider. So we have different you know, products that can go on the board, starting with microcontrollers, and this will be one of the subject today, you know, DSP, FPGAs, but we also have you know, analog parts, we have timing solutions, something which is key also for the subject today is wireless and wired connectivity. Uh, we have FPGA, I mentioned that. Uh, we can also do machine learning with FPGA, but that's not the topic today. If you have any question about that, just you know, ping us after that. And we have some memory uh, type of products. In terms of revenue, we had about 5.5 billion and we have about 20,000 people uh, worldwide. I am based in Phoenix in Chandler, Arizona, and uh, Thomas is based out of Austin. So the positioning of Microchip is to be the embedded control solution company. Recording in progress. So this is a key element here. So for us, is everything is kind of smart, connected, and secure. And we think with machine learning, we have to make we have a way to make smart even smarter. And that, that's the goal we, we have here. So is you know why do we, we think that ML at the edge is a key element for microchip? So as I mentioned, we are the embedded company. So most of our customer, what they're doing is they are using an MCU connected to a sensor. And for us, the, the edge is really that, is the source of the data, which is the sensor, it's connected to a data processor, which is the MCU or the MPU. I think you, you all understand that, so I will go pretty fast, so you can reduce cost. So instead of sending data to the cloud, you do things locally. So you, know, you have less needs for fast communication and to cloud, uh, you know, less need for cloud access as well which also need, means low power. Uh, fast communication is usually what means power. So if you have to send data through 5G or Wi-Fi in real time, that's a lot of power. Uh, we're also working in an application where you have no possible communication. So if you're on the ground or if you're in a forest in the middle of nowhere, you have to be able to run the data processing locally. One big subject for microchip as well as privacy and security. Uh, less data, you, you know, if you don't send the data to someone else, there's less risk about your privacy and also less risk of hacking it. Uh, customer experience, uh, if we have a faster response time, you will have a better customer experience. And in some cases, the real-time operation is also key. Uh, think about safety uh, operation, uh, for example, for even for automotive, you know, with autonomous driving, do you want the uh, system to wait for you know a bad Wi-Fi communication or 5G communication with the cloud to take a decision, or do you want the decision to be taken locally and fast? And in some cases, you can also do some learn, uh, local learning to improve even the performance of the prediction of the model. So the market we we are looking at uh, here are pretty wide. Uh, you know, smart embedded vision. That's a big one. Uh, it's a very wide subject. Uh, but here is camera based. So of course, we have the usual, you know, face recognition, face detection, mask detection. Uh, but we also have a lot of application within, for example, the factory to recognize defect uh, or things like that. The other one uh, that we are focusing on is a smart predictive maintenance. That's a key one for us, and we see that more and more. And for, for our customer, there's a lot of money to save here or uh, new ways to improve their products. Uh, S smart HMI, so smart even machine interface. Uh, of course, audio is one, and we will show you more, uh, but also gesture. So we can have even gesture recognition on the screen, or you can have kind of 3D type of gesture recognition. And just FYI as well, microchip is also in the data center cloud side of it. Uh, we have very fast PCI switches, and we have also a way to you know, interconnect fast memories. So when we decided to, to, you know, to implement machine learning at the edge uh, for microchip, what it means is 
we want that to be available for embedded designer. Our typical customers are embedded designers. So they don't necessarily have a PhD on machine learning. They just understand how it works, what it can do and how it can improve their products, but they don't have the deep knowledge. So we want them to be able to learn or to use machine learning without being experts. Uh, today, it's any microchip, uh, you know, MCU and MPU based on the you know, Cortex core. Uh, we are working on you know, different type of application as well, and different type of core. And I say here, it's basically almost any application when you have a sensor connected and you get data can you know, uh, enjoy, I would say, machine learning here. It's not always true, but I would say in maybe 70 or 80% of the cases, it's true. So what also Microchip is bringing to the table here, as I say, it's to have a complete flow integrated from data generation to the chip programming. So basically to get your data from your own board to, to create your own data set, down to integrating the inference within your project. And then you can program the chip and do, you know, run the whole application, not maybe just machine learning, but the whole application on the, uh, on the chip. Uh, we have partner integration with you know, Edge Impulse. And again, we won't say that is accessible to a better designer. The good thing as well is we have a wide portfolio of MCU and MPUs, and that's what we want. We want to be able to do machine learning on every MCU we, or MPU we have. So it's, there's no dedicated hardware here yet, but you can still do a lot of things with standard microcontrollers. And give, that gives you a lot of flexibility and integration options. Low power, that's a big thing for microchip for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, we have expertise in communication and security as well, which could you know, really help uh, in your project. And we have a lot of you know, local technical support available. So as I mentioned here quickly, uh, predictive maintenance is, is a good thing that we are working on. A lot of customers are looking at that. So it's basically, you know, work the um, as needed based on real time data. So it's not like reactive maintenance when you fix it when it's broken or preventive when you fix everything just in case it may break. Predictive is smarter and will you know, save cost at the end by you know, saving on parts cost, but also on time off cost from the machine because you can now predict when you will have to service it and plan for it. So one example of things that we have done with, uh, with Agipulse here is we tried to make it fun. So we, we decided to do a, you know, use a dumbbell and make it smart. So basically you, you have a, the, um, you know, an, uh, an IMU connected to that with an MCU, which is SAMD 21 M0 core in that case. And we can detect movement. Here it's, it's, a, you know, it's good for fitness, but also good for predictive maintenance because now you can sense a movement and you can understand is a movement is done correctly or something has changed. So is a bearing, starting to go bad or is a blade from a fan is starting to you know break so that's where you can see uh the, the you know how to where to use that same thing with safety uh, you have you know heavy equipment moving around you want to know if it's moving freely or if it's again starting to move on its own and then you have to shut it down one thing, and uh, Thomas will show you that again, we have full project available on microchipdeveloper.com. So we are sharing the whole project and you have a step-by-step -step guide if you want to get started. Smart HMI, uh, again, you can reuse the same project here instead of doing movement, you can do movement in the air and that can be recognized as a gesture. Uh, we have some project where you can recognize, you know, up, down, left, right, or the uh, you know, circle thing. So this could be also a good way to do HMI. The other way to do HMI is also with you know, words. Uh, Thomas will go through the full project, so I'm going fast here again, but keyword spotting. The idea here is you can navigate menus, for instance, very quickly without touching anything. So you can go up, down, left, right, enter. So simple words, so we're not targeting here the Alexa or Google or a Siri type of products, but really keywords to, uh, to control things. So we saw some application where people are controlling a robot as well. Uh, you know, the go stop uh, type of uh, uh, signal. So try also to, you know, for people to get started pretty quickly, we have, 
you know, easy kit and pretty low cost kit. So here it's based on the SAMD21 again, which is an M0 core. And we have bundled that with an IMU either from TDK or Bosch, depending on your preference. Uh, we have two versions of that. Uh, the nice thing as well is if you look at the uh, the boards, there's a, a red one, which is the one with the SAM D21 and the Wi-Fi uh, uh, module. But you can swap the green one with a micro E, a micro electronica, which is one of our partners for hardware, uh, where they have basically, I think, 150 different sensors, uh, click boards. So you can swap these very easily. Uh, so we think it's a very easy and very affordable way to test microchip solution and the, uh, some of the, uh, our partners' uh, solution as well. Here we have another one, uh, which is pretty close to what we did with the keyword spotting, but we also have sound recognition. So here it's more like uh, the demo is, you know, to, to understand where the vacuum cleaner is on, but you can think about maybe doing, you know, baby crying, uh, glass breaking type of application. So these are the, 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 the one thing first, but there's also, for example, for predictive maintenance, you can maybe listen to an equipment and recognize a squeak uh, or, you know, sometime in the uh, sound signature. So for more information, I went pretty fast on that because I, I want to go to the, uh, to the demo side. Uh, for more information here on microchip, you can go to microchip.com slash ML, like machine learning and you will see everything we're doing for with machine learning. So now I'm going to you know, pass it on to Thomas, who is going to guide you on how to implement machine learning with one of our MCU using a real, real project. Hey guys, uh, Tomas here. Uh, I'm a applications engineer at Microchip uh, doing ma machine learning. Um, and I'm going to share some slides uh, and talk about some of our example use cases um, uh, focusing on audio. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see that, Jan? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so the uh, overview is about um, embedded machine learning, specifically with the SAM E54 uh, for kind of audio applications. So uh, sorry, let me just hide this panel. Okay, uh, so just a quick overview of what we're gonna um, go over. Um, so just embedded machine learning development in general with uh, microchip tools. And then I'm gonna go over the keyword spotting demo um, kind of in more detail. Uh, and then a quicker uh, review of the sound recognition uh, slash sound event detection uh, demo. Um, that uses a, a little bit more advanced uh, functionality. Okay. So let's talk about hardware first. Um, so the board on the left is the Curiosity Ultra SAM E54 board. Uh, the SAM E54 is a Cortex M4. Um, I, I believe the, the max frequency is 120 megahertz. Um, this is a uh, nice for audio development um, because it's a pretty capable board. Uh, you know, audio is coming in at 16 kilohertz, 16 bit, um, so it's it's fairly it's fairly high uh, data rate. Um, so we actually have on the microchip direct store uh, this board as well as an audio codec daughter board, um, which I'm showing here. Uh, and on the daughter board, there's a couple analog uh, connectors, a microphone in and a speaker output. Um, so you can kind of play with those types of applications. Uh, it also has a clickboard, microelectronica clickboard adapter on there. Um, so you can um, 
you know, play with other sensors as well on this platform. Uh, the other one that uh, Jan mentioned earlier is the SAMD21 uh, kit. Um, out of the box, it comes with either a, it comes with a six axis IMU. There, there's actually two uh, variants, uh, which is just on a click board. Um, so this kit also, you know, supports any uh, microelectronica uh, click board. Um, and there's some, this is a Cortex M0 plus platform. Um, so it's a little bit less capable, but also lower power. Um, there are, you know, this possibility of doing some audio stuff on there. Um, but I would say that uh, it's probably better suited for lower data rate stuff like uh, IMUs. Um, so I'm going to switch over to software now. So these are the main tools that, um, you know, microchip provides uh, in terms of embedded development for MCUs and MPUs. So that there's an MPLAB X IDE, uh, which is just a desktop uh, IDE. Uh, it has a broad um, array of plugins. Um, I'm gonna be covering the data visualizer and machine learning plugins, which are like most relevant here. There's of course the 32-bit uh, uh, compiler. Uh, and another one to mention is Harmony. Um, which is, it's basically, uh, you know, a graphical user interface um, where you can just drag and drop blocks and connect them together um, to control your device configuration. Um, you know, all these tools are available for free. Um, there's no trial period or anything. So um, that makes it really easy to access. Um, so I want to go a little bit more detail on the plugins, uh, specifically data visualizer. Uh, so what it is basically is uh, something that's integrated into MPLAB X, um, and it allows you to capture uh, sensor data from your device uh, and plot it uh, as a time series data. Uh, it also it works a bit like the interface is similar to like an oscilloscope. Um, so you can select windows of data and it will you know, give you some um, summary statistics on that window of data. Um, but you can also export that data um, to different formats. Um, and so to continue that thread, you can specifically, you can use the machine learning plugin with data visualizer. Uh, to export your data directly to uh, Edge Impulse. So um, the way the flow works is, you know, you basically, you log into your account through uh, the interface, uh, select a window of data, uh, and you can, uh, you just specify the sampling frequency, um, whether you want to, put the data in your training or testing data set. And also you can assign a label to that data. So if you're doing classification, um, that would be the name of your class. Uh, so as Jan mentioned, if you go to microchipdeveloper.com under the uh, functions uh, group, there's, there's a subgroup called machine learning. And this lists all of our example applications, as well as some um, helpful stuff about the uh, machine learning plugin um, and some other um, help with uh, machine learning development with microchip tools. Um, so I'm going to switch over to MPLABX really quickly, just to give you a feel. Uh, for what these tools look like. So uh, I've got a SAMD21 board here. Um, and I've got MPLAB data visualizer open. So I'm going to connect to my board.
And there you can see this is the six axis uh, IMU data. So you can see that I'm just waving around a bit. Um, so uh, if you hit pause, you can kind of scroll through the data. Uh, hit the mark button. And this will bring up cursors on a data visualizer, which um, allow you to select a sub window. So from that, you can either uh, go to the machine learning uh, plugin, uh, select a project that you want to upload it to, um, and some other variables. Uh, you can select which axes um, you want to upload, uh, and it will send it directly to Edge Impulse Studio. Uh, and then the other option is just to export it to, uh, for example, a CSV format, you know, just a, a couple uh, simple formats. Here's a JSON one. All right, so I just want to give you an idea of how that uh, stuff integrates into MPLAB X. Okay, so uh, I'm going to hop over to the keyword spotting example. Um, so I wanted to give you just a quick demo uh, of the board running the application. Um, So you can see there's a detailed walkthrough on microchip developer um, for keyword spotting. So this is what I'm going to cover. Um, uh, so the, basically, this application, what it does is it detects uh, whether yes or no are detected. Um, or if it detects um, you know, an unknown command-like sound. Um, so let me plug that in real quick. Um, hoping you can see this window. OK, so if you, if you can see my camera here. Uh, I have the microphone uh, right up here that's connected through the analog uh, audio daughter board. Um, and there should be a, there's a couple LEDs right here that will light up um, according to which keyword is detected. I believe my focus is off for some reason. Uh, so let me just power it on real quick. Yes. No. Yes. No. So that was, uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. It's a pretty simple application, uh, but, you know, hopefully it shows you the potential uh, of what you can do with audio uh, and machine learning. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now about the demo. Uh, so the data that I use for this um, is from a fairly large data set. Uh, it's you know, over an hour uh, of different people saying several different keywords um, multiple times. Um, so for this demo, I selected yes and no among them, uh, but there's actually several other keywords that you can select. Um, switch over to the uh, GitHub repository really quickly. So th this is linked in the guide as well. And there are some instructions in their repository to select one of, or, or uh, a couple of several keywords from here. Uh, so there's some simple scripts and 
uh, directions here um, that will automatically generate a data set um, based on which keywords that you select. So the way that um, the inferencing is set up, oops, sorry, the way that the inferencing is set up is it's done on one second windows. Um, that's one of the nice things about this data set. It's already cleaned up for you. Um, you know, data management can be pretty time consuming. <laughs> Uh, so this is this is already uh, cleaned up for you, and you can basically decide how you want to split it and and upload it and start training. Uh, for this uh, demo, I just split it up into seventy five percent training data and twenty five percent test data. Um, just wanted to mention, yes, this is from a. Uh, freely available Google speech commands data set um, and also sourced a bunch of background noise to help the model robustness um, from another uh, freely available data set that has some stuff like keyboard typing and um, people speaking and having conversations in the backgrounds and different like house noises, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, just wanted to cover really quickly. So once we have the data, um, how do we get it into Edge Impulse? And so one of the options, as I covered earlier, was like the, the data visualizer tool. And uh, you can um, upload directly from the tool. Um, the other option is Edge Impulse Studio, which has a directly in the interface, you can um, basically open a file explorer and select the files that you want to upload. And it natively supports things like, uh, you know, the wave audio format. Um, and the other option that is listed here that um, I also mentioned in the GitHub readme is uh, the edge impulse uploader. Um, so basically this, um, the steps in the repository will walk you through how you can take the data that gets split up and directly from the command line, just upload it all to your, um, to your Edge Impulse project. So I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, detail um, about how this was implemented. Um, before I show it in Edge Impulse Studio. So uh, you, if you've done audio stuff, especially with voice before, um, you know, the metal frequency capture coefficients are really a uh, common one uh, that's used for different applications. So I kind of, uh, so you, the processing works that you take one second of audio data and then you pass it through this kind of signal processing pipeline um, so it's just a, it's a Fourier transform and uh, it gets passed through a filters that kind of approximate how humans hear. Um, so it's kind of, instead of uniformly distributing the energy for each um, frequency, for each Fourier frequency bin, this does it in kind of a nonlinear way that better matches how um, we perceive sound, basically. Um, so basically, it takes 30 milliseconds at a time um, and passes it through this signal processing pipeline. And then it just, it uses, uh, it runs that window through the entire one second and just stacks those features together. And that that's what ends up uh, going into your neural network. Um, there's also some, uh, there's a mean subtraction and variance normalization feature that Edge Impulse provides. And so basically what it does is it just normalizes, uh, it, it tries to take out the bias and normalize the level so that 
um, it will just be, your model will be more robust to different input signal levels. Um, so this pipeline will be, you don't have to worry about it too much. So the details are kind of under the hood. Um, you just deploy the code from uh, Edge Impulse Studio. Um, this is the just a quick um, capture of the neural network performance for this keyword spotting application. Um, it's basically just the nuts and bolts of like, you know, what goes into the network, what layers does it go through, and uh, uh, what's the output. Uh, it's fairly small at 36. Uh, thousand parameters uh, and uh, also it's about 90% accuracy uh, on the test testing data set. So data that wasn't used in the training. Uh, and there's also a confusion matrix here on the right that summarizes per class kind of performance. Um, so I wanted to walk through a little bit the edge impulse side of things. Um, Switch over here. So this is actually a publicly available um, Edge Impulse project. So you can actually clone this into your Edge Impulse account. Um, this is mentioned in the microchip developer guide and, and linked there. Um, so you can you can get to it from there. Um, but just to show you a little bit more detail, I go into the data acquisition tab. You can see that all the data um, that I've uploaded, this is you know, specifically for the yes and no um, target keywords. Um, you know, obviously Edge, Edge Impulse Studio is very nice and kind of summarizing the data for you really easily. You can play your samples directly from your browser uh, tells you how your data is split up into training and testing. It shows you uh, what um, the split per class. So you can see for, for this one, it's um, you know totally balanced between the four classes. Um, you, you would have to clone this project before you can actually start modifying this data, um, but yeah, when it, whenever you clone the project, it will include the entire project configuration. It'll include the data along with it, um, so you can add or subtract from it. Um, so if we go over to the impulse design, uh, it'll give you a, a summary of basically the pipeline that the data goes through. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the window size, the input size is one second. Um, and there's actually some overlap here. So it actually skips forward by only half a second each time. Um, so this also helps the training process, helps the uh, model be a little bit more robust to um, the placement of the keyword uh, within that one second. Um, the MFCC features that I mentioned earlier are the first kind of step of the uh, processing pipeline. And then that gets directly passed to the neural network, um, which outputs the four different classes. Um, I'll just quickly go through the rest here. Just so you know, um, this is the MFCC configuration page. Um, all these configuration parameters will um, be included in the project that you copy. Um, so you don't have to worry about um, optimizing them too much, but you can certainly play with them. Um, and it'll give you a vis visualization of that what that one second window looks like when it's uh, processed through the uh, M MFCC block. Uh, and then of course the neural network step. Um, and this, uh, for this example, I had actually uh, used the expert setup. So 
basically there are two tabs. There's a simple mode, which is just a visual kind of block base. And then there's an expert mode. So you can actually, from the visual mode, if you switch to the expert mode, it'll generate most of this code for you. Um, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's just, you know, convolutional layers, um, as I described earlier, and a few dropout layers. Uh, it just gives you a little bit more control um, over the different parameters. Um, so finally, you can go over to deployment. So uh, for, for microchip parts, the option you want to select is the C++ library. Um, this will give you just source code, which includes, includes the uh, tensor, TensorFlow library as well as all the DSP code um, for computing the MFCCs. Um, so you would take this code and you would integrate it um, into an existing MPLAB X project. And that's something that um, is both covered in this guide. And there's also a separate guide on microchip developer for integrating. Um, the SDK and a little bit more details uh, about the SDK itself, um, just so you can understand the source code. Okay, so with that, uh, that's pretty much, that was pretty much the whole development pipeline. Uh, there's just one more thing I wanted to mention that, um, important for like audio applications, especially. Uh, so there are basically two modes of inferencing. Uh, the basic inferencing mode is based, is that you use over non-overlapping input windows of audio. Um, so the, the problem with this, especially with like voice um, is that the way that we're structuring the neural network where we don't have any time history. All we have is the one second uh, audio window. So for example, if your keyword of, you know, yes or no uh, happens at the, it happens to um, be recorded at the end of a one second sample, then it might get fragmented across the windows and then your network can't detect it. So what you do in that case to help mitigate that is basically you, you do multiple inferences per uh, input window, basically. So um, Edge Impulse calls this model slices. And what, it, what this uh, mode of inferencing does is just uh, every time you call it, it computes the MFCCs, the features, uh, and it will um, basically it will maintain like a rolling buffer. So you, you add a new um, MSCC input and it drops the oldest one and inputs the new one and then pushes that through the neural network. Um, so that's a really nice uh, feature to do continuous inferencing without um, adding a lot of extra memory um, or processing requirements because you're not you're not redoing the uh, DSP calculations every uh, for the overlapped data. Okay, so quickly I'm going to go over, I think I have something like maybe 10 minutes to go over the uh, sound event detection um, demo. Um, so again, this is on uh, microchip developer. Uh, basically, you know, this what this little demo is showing is I have a vacuum, I've got my hand on the vacuum cleaner on the back there. I'm just turning it off and on. And the terminal, um, let's see if I can expand this. The terminal uh, will show, you know, whether this is noise or vacuum, uh, vacuum cleaner. So,
So um, just a little bit of background about sound event detection. Um, it's a pretty interesting application that's still growing a lot, especially uh, in terms of using machine learning um, to apply to these kinds of problems. Um, in this case, for the vacuum cleaner detection, we are it's a it's a it's a slightly simpler case than doing because because the audio is continuous, um, whereas something like a dog bark uh, or a gunshot might be very um, a very small sample in time, and that's actually a, a little bit hard. It's a little bit harder to manage the data for that um, to train the so that the network gets trained properly. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit trickier. Um, this application uh, or example application would lend itself directly though to continuous audio. Um, so another example of that might be an air conditioner and um, even baby crying is fairly continuous. Um, it's not very hard to extend to that. Um, so just an overview, there are two classifications in this uh, demo, which is vacuum and noise. Uh, it's similar to the other data set uh, in that I'm taking randomly selected background noise to make a noise class. Um, and that includes things like speech, um, other continuous uh, noise sources, um, like an air conditioner. Uh, or TV running in the background. Um, and the uh, vacuum cleaner uh, comes from this uh, Microsoft uh, provided data set. So uh, this is a fairly small data set. Um, so it's only about 10 minutes. Um, and again, the split is, uh, is about the same. It's, it's about an 80, 80, 20 split roughly. Um, just a little bit more background on this application. Um, there, you know, audio is a little bit behind image and video stuff in general in machine learning. Um, so it can be difficult to get quality label data, um, especially if it's a very specific application. So in those cases, you may have to um, collect your own. Um, although you could maybe aug augment that data with a couple of uh, publicly available data sets um, that I mentioned here. One of the big ones is the uh, Google one, the audio set. And there's also one from freesound.org, um, which are interesting to look at uh, to you know, develop a proof of concept kind of thing. Um, yeah, what you run into from source, sourcing online samples is obviously you have very, various SNRs, um, various types of signal processing, uh, the sensor setup uh, can have, you know, digital and analog distortions. Uh, and you just, uh, you don't know uh, what's being in introduced into these different um, samples. So ideally, either you have kind of noisy data set that's very large, or a smaller data set that is very um, well specified um, so that at least you have the information um, about the sensor and the environment which it was collected in and those kinds of things. Uh, so for this application, I actually used a custom processing block. Um, it is pretty similar. There's a little bit less processing actually that's, that's happening with compared to the MSCC. Um, it's something that's better for general audio. Uh, it will work for voice, um, but um, it definitely works better for, for a general kind of sound recognition applications. Um, so the setup is pretty similar, you know, 32 millisecond frames, they get passed through a Fourier transform. Uh, you take the power of that, and pass it through a Mel filter bank again. Uh, and then there's a log. Uh, uh, it gets passed through a log function as well. Uh, the rest of this is 
fairly low level detail. So we'll go into, um, so the way that I implement this is actually, because it's so similar to one of the features that's built into the um, Edge Impulse library is uh, you can actually just modify it slightly. You can tweak it slightly uh, from what gets deployed to implement this. Um, let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, custom processing blocks. Um, so this is a really nice feature of Edge Impulse Studio. Sometimes um, the feature processing blocks that they already have in the studio are either don't work well with your data, um, with your data type, or um, are just don't support your data type at all. And maybe you don't want to, you still want to do some processing before you pass it to the neural network. So this is a way to do it. Um, you basically set up a server uh, and expose a public um, HTTP and you can paste that server into the uh, Edge Impulse Studio as a processing block. And it's nice thing is that it integrates really nicely. So the image that I have here on the right in the middle um, is the log MFE features that I implemented. And so all I did was, you know, there, there's a configuration file that determines what parameters are configurable and, uh, you know, what's the range. And you can even in, add in little help tool tips. So it looks just like a built-in feature with um, relatively little work. Um, just quickly, uh, the reason that I chose this for this particular application is um, I just didn't find that the MFE and the MFCC built-in um, features worked as well as log MFE for my data. Um, so it's something I wanted to explore, partly just to explore the custom block uh, feature. Um, but uh, there's a comparison on the right here. If you look at the visualization, uh, there's MFCC on the left, which is just this big ball of intertwined uh, samples uh, where it's really hard to differentiate uh, between the classes, the, the orange being one class and the blue being another. Whereas with the log MFE transform on the right, you can see there's some pretty clear class separation. So it's a good indicator that your model is gonna learn, uh, it's gonna have an easier time learning the separation between these classes basically. Uh, and so this is just the uh, pipeline, uh, simple 2D convolutional net, um, very small, 4,000 parameters, um, and high uh, test accuracy. Uh, and so I think that concludes um, my part of the presentation. Uh, we're going to open up things to questions. There's a question on the chat, Thomas. Uh, but the how large was the keyword spotting model? I think I have that in my slide if you want me to look. Um, so I guess there are a few. So what we have was flash Y was 170 kilobytes and RAM was about 120 kilobytes. Yeah, so the, the model itself is about 36,000 parameters. What that converts to in terms of the full firmware um, is actually posted on the GitHub repository. Uh, so about 170 kilobytes flash, um, 120 kilobytes RAM. Uh, I should mention that uh, this includes the heap memory usage um, as well as the static um, memory usage. So that's the requirements for the overall application, not just the model.
So Zin, this was the only question I saw on the uh, on the chat. Any any other questions? Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. So I think we are at the end of our session here. I hope you you found it useful. We are trying to find you know, to, to to share every project we are doing, so you can get started from there and learn from what we what we can share. Uh, that's the idea here. So I think if we don't have any more questions, we can end here. Uh, Thomas, thank you. Uh, Jim Paul, thank you for the invitation. It was a, a great show, and uh, we'll talk next time. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.